Is it that we've been to space and we've been to the moon using readily available technology for which the patents can be looked back upon? Or is it also possible that ancient aliens came down and visited planet Earth, seeded our entire human race, and they're still hiding inside of the moon, sending out alpha waves to control our minds? I'm gonna send it to outer space. Hello and welcome to Trolling with Logic for December 4th, 2016. This is your host, Nathan Dickey, and with me are all the regular crew today, plus one more, a veteran TWL member, Marty. Marty, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Pretty busy nowadays, that's why I'm not really here all the time. Yeah, we hear you. We also have Cal. Uh, I'm doing all right. And I just want to say, Jen, I really hate you for this. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, Jen is here dealing with her conscience and feeling guilty for all the rest of us for what she put us through. Luckily, I've had a very, very good night's sleep of up to, t I think it was 12 to 14 hours, so I can actually deal with it. Whereas you guys are going to be not sleeping for nights to come. I'm not sleeping nowadays anyway, so that's okay. Yeah, same here. So, Kitch, how are you doing? Why? Why did we watch this awful, awful movie? We'll get into the why, I'm sure, as the show goes on. And Julia, how are you coping? Pretty well considering. So today we're reviewing a conspiracy theory documentary or montage film uh, i'm not sure quite how you would describe it it's somewhere between abomination it's somewhere between amateur video and documentary although documentary is makes it sound a little more sophisticated than it really is i think you would struggle to even call this an audiovisual slideshow it's just, <laughs> it just it just i think it aspires to be a film this yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's called, Operation Crappy Clip. It's, um, we should probably refer to it as something like that throughout, but the official title is Secret Space, and uh, it's posted on YouTube as The Secret Space Program. And this is a documentary about a secret space program developed by the Nazis and the Third Reich in parallel with the U.S. space program and about how the moon landings were fake and Project Paperclip bringing all the Third Reich scientists over to America to found uh, NASA, basically a secret front group for the Third Reich. It goes into stuff like uh, space serpents and back engineering ufo technology and all this sorts of stuff and the motives are never really made clear for why all this stuff is going on it's just they're kind nazis of... they don't need motives clearly though they're going after the space jews yeah the nazis need to get to space to exterminate the space jews though But that's the other thing um, we noticed with this film was that nearly everybody is either a Jew or a Nazi. Yeah, I never really thought much about that aspect of it. There's no people on the sidelines, no third party, now that I think about it. I think the first thing and the most glaring thing about this film is the sound design, which is just so horrible. I don't think I'll ever hear anything worse. Than... It is basically... Mom! Yep. That's it. Every sentence ends with one. They cut um. people. They cut people halfway through a sentence. It's just so obnoxious and it's... I just can't... Um. The soundtrack is basically Inception on crack, right? Yeah. A bad attempt at Inception on crack. 
And yeah, it sounds about right. It seems like we discussed before, this is stock music overload on here. It's just constant noise in the background. And uh, I don't know, it's a blessing because it takes away from what some of the people are saying. Fast and Furious had a less dramatic soundtrack. It, it's, it's just terrible if you want to be able to bear watching it. But it, it's so obvious that they're trying to make the audience feel uncomfortable and, you know, scare people. It's that kind of fear music, isn't it? It's like when people use really low frequency noises and oscillations within cinemas to disturb people and make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, And then they give them a message that they want them to take to heart. That that seems like that's the whole point. They even throw in jump scares with the picture of the grey alien. Yeah, Yeah, I I really did not need to be reminded that Indiana Jones 4 happened. Some of us use headphones and, you know, yeah, thank you. Well, I think we should go through this scene by scene from the beginning. It starts out looking like it's going to be a standard moon landing hoax movie because they start out talking about the 1969 Apollo 11 landing on the moon and they say it was faked by NASA. But about five minutes after that, where the narrator is saying, we're going to explain to you and show definitive, conclusive proof that it was fake. After he goes through that little introduction, it shifts gears completely and forgets all about that and starts talking about Project Paperclip. And Yeah, it, it, it's just hilarious that it starts out with moon hoaxers and it gets dumber from there. Yeah, moon hoax stuff actually sort of eases you in. One of my favorite parts at the very beginning of it is the narrator goes, we will show you conclusively that these photographs were definitely faked or they might have just been processed a little bit. He says at least heavily manipulated, if not outright faked. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that. I was really downplaying your own game there. Yeah. They, they even bring up the, the whole, there can't be any uh, light sources on the moon except the sun. I'm sorry, the moon acts as a light source granted it doesn't send out its own light but it reflects light i mean these are things that uh, do you even have to explain what's stupid about this and they they cite this as proof oh you mean the the multiple shadows typing that they glance yeah. at the beginning of the, oh, yeah, there, there must have there's been there's only one sources. there's only one light source and there's light coming from multiple directions when I'm in my room and all, uh, the sunlight's coming in through the window, there's light hitting me from all around because it's reflecting off the walls and the floor and the ceiling. And it's so stupid. Then there's the thing about the, the lunar module is too small to carry all the astronauts in. Yeah. That's... Well, they're wearing full spacesuits. It's too small, apparently. That's what they said. You know, you would think that if it was faked, they would think about all these things. Especially the size of the lunar module and the supposedly nail in the coffin that, oh, there's no crater under the module. Stuff like that. Yeah, so when they come around to actually making the the moon missions, to to go to the moon, to go through the Van Allen belts, etc., which we'll probably talk about later. Apparently, all the technology that we've been developing for decades beforehand during the war, etc., that's irrelevant now. Or we didn't have enough technology to do it. Yeah, Yeah, um... they contradict themselves quite a lot. Yeah, uh, Marty, maybe you can... What is this whole Van Allen belt thing? Yeah, okay. A lot of the radiation that comes from the sun is in the form of protons. And they're positively charged, so they interact with the the Earth's magnetic field. And basically, instead of landing on the Earth, you know, going straight down, they get stuck in the magnetic field. They end up in orbit, essentially. So, uh, yeah, you've got these radiation belts surrounding the Earth. And... uh, of course, that's one of the things that the moon hoaxers are on about because, you know, radiation will kill you. So if you go to the moon, you have to go through the Van Allen belts. Okay, so first of all, no, you don't. You can go over them. You can go below them. You know, space has three dimensions. Uh, but another thing is that protons are ginormous as far as radiation particles go. And what that means is that they penetrate very poorly into matter. So uh, a thin sheet of metal is enough. And uh, I know all these people who say, uh, you know, who who believe in all this crap. They want uh, uh, anecdotal evidence, as they call it. I have personal experience with neutrons that are actually even bigger. I have experimented with them. They don't do anything because 
it's easy to shield yourself against them. And yes, the tin foil thin hull of a, of a spacecraft is enough. One thing that they were talking about. My tin foil hat will protect me from the neutrons from the space Nazis. Well, yeah, actually, it would. Probably would do, yeah. Uh, one thing that the conspiracy theorists often like to talk about in regards to the moon missions is also the Starfish Prime um, nuclear test that happened, high altitude nuclear test, which would have put more uh, radiation into orbit as well. And there was this whole whole fear that the Van Allen belts would be much, much worse to go through at that point in 1969. I think Starfish Prime happened in the early 60s. But when they actually went through the process of um, determining how severe the risk was for the Apollo missions, they actually determined that if they went through the Van Allen belts fast enough, it wouldn't cause that much issue anyway, even without any pr extra protection. And they, I think they gave all the astronauts dosimeters anyway, yeah. um, which just confirmed their, their theory that it wouldn't actually be such a big deal if they went through it at enough velocity. Yeah, I mean, the, the stuff I did with, with neutron radiation was... Uh, and it's essentially the same thing from from that perspective anyway it was you know several hours in doing a, an experiment in college and that's yeah that that's so harmless they let undergrads do it but the guy did say the narrator in this film said at one point radiation is so powerful it can cause nausea and cancer and i was thinking well if radiation just makes you a bit sick it's not actually that bad considering that the sun can absolutely fry you to fucking death yeah and it wouldn't even do that you wouldn't even come into contact with it because it doesn't go through the hole. Exactly. Which then led to one of their most bizarre claims, which was they spoke to someone. They don't cite who, but they said somebody said the spacesuits wouldn't be suitable to use a Chernobyl. And that's all he says. And it, he no, doesn't ask, <laughs> what's the conclusion you're drawing? And the other question is, well, why aren't they suitable for Chernobyl? Well, because that's gamma radiation. Yeah, but that's the thing. He doesn't really ex give any... He doesn't say... And they, and they talk about gamma radiation and X-rays in space. Yeah. I've got news for you. The Earth's magnetic field doesn't interact with electromagnetic radiation. And furthermore, the atmosphere, those kinds of radiation go through solid lead. The atmosphere does absolutely nothing to protect us from it so if space around earth is full of x-rays and gamma rays and it's enough to kill astronauts then we would be dead that's a good point the next thing they go into quite a bit is operation paperclip this was a program implemented by the united states the oss office of strategic services their goal was to bring Nazi scientists, engineers, technicians to the U.S. The reason they did this historically was to keep the Third Reich from taking these engineers and scientists for themselves to use their knowledge. We wanted to take advantage of what they knew instead of the Soviet Union to have an advantage in the Cold War and also to keep post-war Germany from redeveloping their war technology. But the reason given in this documentary is a little bit different. They wanted to create, according to this film, sort of a Nazi front group to continue the Third Reich or uh, as David Icke calls it in this film, the Fourth Reich. Yeah, I never got that. Are they suggesting that the American government took those Nazi scientists because the American government was consisting of Nazis who fought the Nazis? Or What? I have a hard time wrapping my head around what exactly they were getting at there as well. Yeah, but Nazis, so, you know, Nazis. Yeah, it's, it seems like the whole idea is that, uh, yeah, they had Germans who did come from Nazi Germany. They did work developing weapons for the Nazis, yes. And after the war, they went to work for the Americans. Therefore, exactly. Nazis are working for the Americans. Therefore, the Americans are Nazis. I'm sorry, what? And it's like saying any any scientists that were involved in the efforts to make the the um, cruise missiles, etc., in Germany are necessarily evil because they're you know it's guilt by association. Yeah. Yeah, and also it doesn't matter if they were evil. What's relevant is what did they accomplish as scientists. Military technology has no ideological basis. Exactly. And you can, you can argue that if someone is helping Nazi Germany develop weapons 
If you live in Germany, I think you have a vested interest in not having the allied forces come in and kill you. So, I mean, you would be interested in protecting yourself, and you're doing that by helping develop weapons for Hitler to kill people with. I mean, it's, it, it's not black and white. Of course, one of the reasons that these conspiracy theorists see these guys as evil is because of this perceived occult link between the Nazis and their designs and their weaponry and, and also these disc-shaped crafts that have, were apparently developed by them. Do we have any experts on Vril power here, by the way? On what? Vril power, something that was briefly discussed in this. That sounds like something. No idea. Sounds like it should be in Voyager, that. Well, kind of, I suppose, yeah, but Vril energy is... Yeah, it's the occult, basically, which is another aspect to this particular conspiracy theory. It was only mentioned briefly, like in passing, when they were talking about the V1 doodlebug and the V2 being a forerunner to the Saturn V rocket. Yeah, it's derived from mm. the Black Sun, represented symbolically by the swastika. And it was first described in sci-fi probably 150 years ago oh. and then taken seriously, much like Scientology, surprisingly enough. Is it related <laughs> to the Vril book? I think so, something like that, yeah. I've just looked that up, that's just... God, this stuff gets nuttier all the time. The superior subterranean master race and the energy forum called Vril. Yeah, the Vril is a substance first described in Edward Bueller Lytton's 1871 novel, The Coming Race, which was later reprinted as Vril, the power of the coming race. And they're saying they, they used Vril power, so they used this occult derived undefined power to lift them up and it was all woo, spooky shit. Yeah, well, you know, Hitler was looking for the Lost Ark and, and almost got... Oh, no, wait, that was a movie. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, but they're making... When they showed the videos of well, they're supposedly these discs or whatever flying, which are, you know, you call it UFOs, unidentified flying objects, just stress that. They're guessing and they're presenting as fact that oh, this is the way they should work and this is how they're working and this is what they're doing and this is their purpose. It's, all just on a stock video of just something weird. I don't know. I don't have the skills to say what it is. Most uh, of them are airplanes shown from the front or the rear, so it looks... Sp spooky. Yeah, if you assume that it looks the same from every direction, then it would look obviously be a saucer-shaped. Well, there have actually been saucer-shaped crafts developed as well, though. I mean, oh, there, yeah, there have been... That, there have been that, they didn't do yeah. very well, but... No, I mean, exactly. There's, there's, there's one guy, but his name is Moller, and he's been trying to make sky cars a thing for, for decades now. And he keeps trying to get funding and he keeps failing and they're not very good. But one of his no. was a disc shaped thing, I think with uh, six fan motors in it. And it didn't get very far, but he based it on that kind of old idea that a disc shape would be fantastic and never got off the ground, funnily enough. Yeah, it's not a very practical shape. So the movie implies that the UFOs were developed by Germany based on the plans they got from the aliens. There were, according to this film, vast rocket laboratories and uh, rocket factories in Pinamunda and Nordhausen. And the, but, uh, the Nathan, facility... Remember, sorry, I've just got into it. Remember, though, they do stress at the start, it's all funded by Jewish money. I have no oh, idea yeah, how this obviously. is... Because that makes total sense. The Nazis would want to exterminate their funders. It just, yeah. Or, or the funders would want to fund the people that are killing them. Well, and Area 51 in the Mojave Desert is apparently the Nordhausen facility rebuilt. Just just, just on a note, um, is this David I a uh, Holocaust denier? Because that would make sense. I'm not no sure. Idea. I'll look that up right now as we're speaking of. That would make so much sense. Yeah, speaking of David Icke, he goes into Prescott Bush, George Bush's grandfather, and how he funded the Nazis through the Union Banking Corporation and some oil and steel businesses that he helped fund or supply the Third Reich with. To a when lot of... was this supposed to have been? This was supposed to have been in the 1940s during the height of World War II. Oh, okay. The stuff that David Icke goes into is a little bit of obscure history. He's trying to connect it to what's happening now with NASA, but not very well. There's a lot of obscure facts and trivia about President's grandfathers and William Farish III and banking and steel and oil. We never really get to hear what the connection is to any of the other stuff that's going on. 
Now, I like the fact that they bring in this reputable source of um, and authority that is David Icke, and as soon as they do so, he advertises his book. Yeah, Tales from the Time Loop. I gotta love the title at least. Oh, glad you got that because you can go out and buy it now, can't you? Well, I've got a PDF of the whole book that I got do for free. Do not buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Save your money this Christmas. Some of my friends have bought tickets to see David Icke when he comes over here and his talk in Manchester. I didn't. I would not give him my money. I'd, I'd have to be paid to sit through him. I need the money. Years ago, a co-worker of mine gave me a David Icke book, modestly called The Biggest Secret, which is one of his more well-known books. And I Did can't... you use it to hit him with it? It's not much of a secret if he knows about it. Can well, I say you didn't well, run out was... of toilet paper that Christmas, did you? That was my first introduction to David Icke. I had never heard of him before then. This was like eight or nine years ago. And I can say that reading his work is mildly entertaining. I think your friend just gave you a really elaborate middle finger for a, crisp, for a present. Uh, just to come back, yes, David Icke does deny the Holocaust happened. And he claims, it. And he claims that the Jews financed Hitler. So according to David Icke's perspective in this film, everybody is a Jew and a Nazi. Yes, the whole film, that's what it's based on, that everybody's a Jew or a Nazi. When you watch this film, you'll start to question yourself if you're a Jew or a Nazi by the end of it. They talked about the Jews being enslaved and forced to build the rocket facilities in Germany. And a few sentences before that, they talked about all these war efforts being funded by Jews. They mentioned it in yes. passing. Yeah, I caught yeah. that straight away. Oh, but did he also catch... The fact that these rockets being built in Germany were fueled by helium. I think that meant hydrogen because helium is an inert gas. And what's one of the qualities of an inert gas? It doesn't fucking react. It's not combustible. Well, ah. I, I think they were using uh, those rockets, kind of the balloon principle. You just let the gas out one end and it'll go in the other or something. I I, I have no idea. Compressed how, helium? Compressed yeah, air? compressed helium. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's but it does better to so use hydrogen. Ridiculous. Yeah, that'll, I mean, the whole point is that when you burn a gas, it expands. Wow. You, can't, you can't burn helium. It doesn't react. So then the film goes into Sputnik 1. It mentions the Russians getting Yuri Gagarin into Earth orbit before the Americans were able to. And then... And the oddly, the radiation didn't kill him. Yeah. Didn't they just talk about how that can never happen? They didn't even present it as a hoax. They said, oh yes, in 1957, by the way, they got that wrong. They say that Sputnik 1 was launched in 1954 when it was actually 57. That's a minor error. But they don't present that as a hoax. They just say, state matter-of-factly that it happened and that they sent the first man, Yuri Gagarin, into Earth orbit. And then, abruptly, they drop that subject. Yeah, they, they also say that there's a lot of space debris and all that sort of junk that, may, that can make being in space impossible. And then, oh yeah, you'd, you'd be shredded by micrometeorites, yeah. But then they also say later on in the film, when they were, explain, when they, when they were showing the videos of uh, whatever, whatever that was in space, they said that, oh, if that was ice crystals or if it was debris, it was shred through the cockpit, it'd be very dangerous in space. But you just said earlier in the film that it is dangerous in space, that there is that kind of junk up there. What is it? And also, just before they go any further on that, they, they talk about how uh, the Nazis, etc., believed in aliens and how they wanted to colonize the moon as a moon base to launch attacks against the Earth. Yeah, Project Horizon, they mention, uh, colonization of the moon. Whoever controls the moon controls the Earth, because according to this, whoever has a military base on the moon can launch missiles, and the country being aimed at can't do anything about it. Also known as the plot from Iron Sky. Yeah, yeah. Which was a much so, better movie. So the, the Nazis <laughs> wanted to build a death star? A death moon. Yeah, but... Even then, if you're launching rockets for the moon, wouldn't they take a bit of a while to get towards Earth? Like it would take a bit of a yeah. day or so. It, it's the worst attack ever. You'd see him coming as a heat signature from fucking yeah. thousands of miles away. I mean, this is kind of not even Star Trek Voyager that plots as idiotic. No. No. It's kind of funny that the only real, the only common thread of the movie is that there is no common thread. It's 
it seems to be made by someone with no sense of focus. They start things, they don't go into them, they mention something and then they move on. Pretty much, yeah. And also he, on that particular note, he starts talking about the Hubble Space Telescope and saying, well, you know, there's tons of spy satellites up there. You want proof? Hubble. It doesn't go, do you want proof? Like here's patents for all the different types of spy satellites and ground-based uh, telescopes and here's Google Earth and all this sort of stuff. He goes, Hubble. Yeah, yeah and... and uh... Hubble, I mean, wasn't that designed by NASA? I mean, if that's the case, all of that information is public domain. Exactly. If you Hubble can't trust spy. that information, then they have no information to base their accusations on. Yeah, don't they say that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was a spy satellite or something? Yeah. yeah. So, and it's designed to spy on every enemy nation on Earth, which they define as any country that's not America. That's why it's pointing away from the Earth. Yeah, but what they don't tell you, Marty, is about all the other apertures that are pointing towards Earth and also the lasers and rockets and missiles that are attached to it as well. Oh, the lasers. Yeah, the lasers, okay. yeah. Uh, I thought it was spying on aliens in another galaxy or something. That as well, probably. Well, it depends if those aliens are Jews. What they don't tell you about Hubble is that it's actually omniscient, omnipotent, and they can see everywhere all at the same time. This is symbolic of anti-science views, isn't it? They take a iconic symbol of science and discovery like the Hubble Space Telescope and they turn it into something completely different that's anti-humanity and evil and claim that its purpose is something completely different than what it was actually designed for. Yep. Yeah, they say they've done that with the Large Hadron Collider and uh, there's too many others I can remember right now. One thing that was making mm -hmm. Cal quite angry beforehand was the fact that when they were showing the pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope, they had all these quotes from famous people on what they apparently believe about alien life in the universe, as if it means anything. Someone go, yeah, well, I think there's probably some aliens out there. And they, they had this sort of dramatic score in the background, and it was just like, oh, look, these famous people believe aliens are out there. Yeah, because they use Sagan, and I'm pretty sure what Carl Sagan would have to say if he was alive right now and knew he was being attached to this. Oh, he would not appreciate this at all. This is kind of like when Zeitgeist uh, showed a clip from Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos series, and you're just thinking, leave him alone. I still need to watch that. Another oh, interesting Zeitgeist. thing about that is, wouldn't all of those scientists deny it? I mean, aren't they in on the conspiracy to cover it up? Oh, yeah. They but just that's... can't keep their mouth shut, though. That was one thing was a blatant misunderstanding of a quote. They, I can't remember the guy's name who they're quoting, but he says something that NASA has been helped by the people of other worlds. Oh, this was yeah. a Hermann Oberth yeah. that yeah. they quote. I've got the quote here. Uh, he says, Today we cannot produce machines that fly the same as UFOs do. They are flying by means of artificial fields of gravity. This would explain the sudden changes of direction and on and on and on. I don't know if this quote is taken out of context or what he was talking about, but statements like this sound to me the same as saying, we cannot produce machines that fly the same as flying carpets do. And I yeah, I, I actually did look into that, and, and Oberth said quite a few things to imply that he actually believed that uh, aliens were popping around. Okay, so... It's a leap in logic never, as well, isn't it? It's this idea that if you see something that you can't explain and it happens to be in the sky, it must be aliens. Aliens. But they never actually explain what's... Okay, there's... Okay, granted, there's aliens. What are they doing? Why are they just... Are they just... What are they doing? What's, what's the whole point? Come on, you're making stuff up about everything else. You may as well speculate wildly about what they're doing. Well, the space worms are at least rehydrating, right? Yeah, they're, they're uh, using photosynthesis and hydrating themselves by flying around in the upper atmosphere, according to this Chris Everard guy who believes in space serpents. Yeah, you never see them near rivers, you know, that'd be quite handy. Well, because they live in outer space. I wonder what kind of propulsion they use to actually escape the gravity of the planet once they've done feeding on the upper atmosphere fluids, which aren't actually there. Clearly, they externalize their gases, which are, which are composed of methane, hydrogen sulfide, uh, recaptose, and oh wait, no, sorry, I'm taking a farting because this movie is crap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting, the, the so-called footage that they show with the dramatic music once again, it just looks like something being blown about in the sky, like someone's released one of those really long balloons and it's just floating around. Yeah, just, that's what I thought. I just looked like, like a clearly. 
just looked like a shopping bag to me flying in the wind, that's all. That reminds me when I was watching that. Do you ever see that episode, an episode of Family Guy where uh, Peter is filming a piece of trash blowing in the wind and he starts going on saying, oh, this is the most beautiful thing. It just puts my circulatory system to shame. That was me just- poking fun at the film American Beauty, highly acclaimed film here in the U.S. where a psychologically troubled character finds solace in filming a empty piece of plastic bag floating around in the wind. Yeah, uh, and it cuts to God, and it's just him just saying, it's just a piece of trash floating in the wind. Do you have any idea how complicated the circulatory system is? It just reminded me exactly of that scene. I was like, it's just some trash floating in the wind, you fucking idiots. What I find interesting as well is a lot of these UFO footages where they say you can't explain the, you know, the changes in the direction that they're going in very swiftly, all that kind of stuff. Anybody who's alive today who's a conspiracy theorist knows about drones, which you can pick up for no money at all and which move in a very, very similar way. I was to say that back then, sort of a decade, two decades ago, drones couldn't have existed and been, been being tested, sort of quadcopters, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, but very few of them will actually go into that side of it. They, they won't go, well, we've got the technology now. Why couldn't we have had it back then? Which is something that they do all the time with other subjects. Because they you can't make... prove that that's what it was, so it's more likely that it was aliens. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> I want to believe it's aliens, therefore it's aliens. Sorry, carry on, Julia. Oh, just how they managed to make every piece of footage so blurry, like every single one. Is there none at all that's somewhat decent? Yeah, I completely agree. The footage of the UFOs and aliens and whatnot, they make gra- other grainy photographs look clear by comparison. Well, the grainier and the more out of focus the image is of an alien or of any kind of UFO, the more reputable it is. Yeah, and it's because when you fake it, you need it to be out of focus so that you can't tell it's fake. I'm proposing we call this the inverse grain law. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's funny, actually, when they did a little switch between two different segments, they also showed a a known fake where I think it's in, in Dubai or something like that, and they're in this building and something goes whoosh past. Um, and they use that as one of their evidences. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because the amount of thought that went into selecting their clips is pretty much not. So it reminds me of one of the videos from um, Cool Heart Logic. The guy, he's talking about video that was already bad, and then he played it on a TV, and he filmed that. So he was just introducing more and more artifacts on top of what was already a blurry video. Yeah, that, that's another thing. At least several of the uh, the space uh, videos that, that we saw in, in this in this video was they were full of these things that could easily be camera artifacts. Yeah, because I remember listening to those videos, and there were you can hear the astronauts talking to the ground controller or uh, whatever they're called, and you can hear them talk about oh, it, we can see something flashing. And I was looking at the video, and I couldn't really see anything flashing. But another thought that struck my head is if they are seeing aliens, alien spacecraft. Why aren't they react like what the film is suggesting? Why aren't they reacting more? It's because they're in And that's aren't why they? the video was published. Yeah. That's why the yeah. Didn't the guy say that the person who leaked that video got killed? Something like that, yeah. It was that old story well, of my source my source got killed, but he also said NASA hasn't released the footage, so we had to get it from somewhere else. Except that NASA releases all their footage, it's public domain. I think what he said was that the the video wasn't supposed to have come out and that his source was now dead. And he kind of casually says that. I'm wondering, like, did he die of natural causes and he's just putting that in there casually to make it seem like thing happened? Oh, he knew what he or was Or was implying. he making shit up? I think what he was doing is he was saying basically, slyly, he was saying, well, I did that and I used a pseudonym and now that pseudonym doesn't exist anymore. And he didn't seem very scared for his own life either. No, that, that, that's that's the interesting thing. All of these people keep implying that, oh, you know, and if anyone were to leak anything, they'd disappear. Here it is. Uh, this is something we should talk about, the Mir space station. They have a whole segment about astronauts were having problems locating the Mir space station they were trying to get to because hundreds and hundreds of UFOs started popping out and appearing all around the surrounding space. 
and mission control at Houston becomes confused as more and more of them appear. They try to adjust the contrast, but the UFOs can still be seen everywhere. This was one of the more interesting segments. I mean, the, the footage was really poor to start with. I mean, it was very, very yeah, low you can't, quality. You can't tell anything. Yeah, and then they put the gain up and they put the contrast up and you could barely see anything at all. Uh, from a photographic point of view, the kind of gain that they had on that, the intense contrast that they had on that, it would have picked up anything in front of the lens whatsoever. A piece of hair or a piece of dust floating in front of the lens would have been picked up if there was any light glinting off of it. So fuck knows what it was. Yeah, that's that, that's another thing I kept reacting to. There was a clip of something apparently being fired at some alien ship or something. It looks like there, there's this thing floating and all of a sudden it just zooms off like it's being shot at something. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. So, so, uh, another interpretation of that that I've seen somewhere is that it engages its warp drive. Oh, I've seen that. And I've also seen them saying it was an ion cannon fired from the ground to disperse yeah. the alien UFOs. Yeah, that's another one. That's pretty much what it would look like if like an ice crystal is floating in space and it's being hit by the sun all of a sudden. Or thrusters. It's, yeah, it, but it starts melting. That gives it a thruster. It, it'll be, you know, conservation of momentum. There you go. Any kind of maneuvering thrusters as well would cause that to happen. I mean, if you've got any kind of particles around maneuvering thrusters or even particles that are emitted from a maneuvering thruster, if that happens, I think there's ice. Mm. I, I can't remember exactly how it works, but they would be flung off. Or maybe, Marty, it's going at infinite velocity. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> and yet still don't picked start. up by a camera that does a few frames a second. Oh, Einstein, I, I, I think Einstein felt that one. Infinite velocity. Infinite velocity. So that's really fast. <laughs> so fast that breaks the speed of light, which is See, Kit just isn't picking up on this. You're not picking up on this at all, Kit. It's quite actually quite amusing. Star Trek? Yes. We're, going to, we're not going to go that far into that. That could be a whole podcast on its own, that episode. Voyager? Oh, yes. Yep. Right, we'll leave it there. We don't want to the do... Voyager episode. I see. I think we should do a whole show just on that episode. With there's so much to cover. Did anyone anyway, notice after this se segment that there was some fantastic rave music to the tune of Rockets? Is that when they were talking about the space shuttle mission STS-80? Yeah, they started with some awesome '90s rave music. It was fantastic. Was that them just trying to say, trying to actually tell you just to drop some E if you want to make it through the rest of the film? <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, I have to say, I didn't actually manage to watch. I started watching it earlier, but I got interrupted by a phone call. And like I say, I'm looking back, that was a real blessing in disguise, that. If you watched about 40 minutes of it, you've basically seen the whole thing, because I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but the particular copy on YouTube, it starts over from the beginning, starting around the 45-minute mark. Yeah, I caught that. I was like, wait, what? Yeah, Why is it playing again? There are a couple of other ones um, which are out there, which are actually the full length, which is two, well, it's almost but three hours in parts one and two. There's no new information. It's just the same thing said in different ways anyway. Pretty much, yeah. Well, I've actually been looking up and he has made a sequel to this somehow. Yeah. People ask for a second film. I don't think anyone people asks. are stupid. Are these the same people who, I don't know, want to charge our things? Um, what was this thing I also remember they were going on about the one field of gravity or something that powered one of these craft? Is that any scientific basis to this? Nope. Okay, that's that. <laughs> well, was that when they mentioned anti-gravity? They were saying there's a one, It's this craft was powered by one field of gravity, one of the lower field. They're going about all these different fields of gravity, which... They have no idea what they're talking about. Do you mean when they were saying all these orbs joined together into this long string of orbs and then that long string of orbs, they'd only have to have one engine to propel them, propel them all into space, whereas if they were all separate, they had to have lots of them? No, this was the design of the Nazi UFOs and they said they were propelled by, they were using helium and they were using a field, a gravity field and all this kind of stuff. Oh. But that's a whole other episode as well. If you have a look up, there's a documentary, if you want to call it that, on the Nazi bell, which you've got to watch to understand that. I think there's a lot that you could research separately in this rabbit hole of a movie because they, they throw so much stuff at you that takes context to really get at what they're talking about. I think they assume that their audience knows some of the background on each of the things they're throwing at you. They just assume that. Yeah, pretty much. But there's so much garbage out there and none of it. It's like... 
the most frustrating bit of research you'll ever do because you're always like around the next corner there's got to be a basis for this there's got to be a base assumption or there's got to be a base bit of knowledge that they're basing this all on but every single time you go into it there's another story and it's just a story that's all it is there's no actual reality behind it it's just somebody asserting some sort of fantastical bit of sci-fi and that's it yeah it's what got me is they just they couldn't find a single expert even loosely connected to the fields to say something i mean i'm going to put down my own field of study like mechanical engineering surely you could have gone to a universe somewhere and found an engineering student who would gladly say you know say what you want to say that would at least you'd be kind of getting in the rough direction of credibility you wouldn't be anywhere near it so but at least you'd be sort of pointing in there but there's no there's no expertise whatsoever presented by anybody here indeed and david ike is a multi-millionaire so even if he wanted to get someone paid to do this kind of stuff he could probably do it he could probably find somebody who's who's got a qualification that he could have paid but no he came on himself yeah I mean, like i said i'm sure there's some uh, like I said, I'm using the engineer, but like, there's some engineering graduate out there who's hard up, he's wanting a few bucks, and they could have just shoved us, and they could have gone on camera to say something. Uh, I want to go back to this guy they bring in, Chris Everard, who's talking about the space serpents. I have a quote from him from this documentary that illustrates exactly the mere assertion aspect that you just mentioned. He says, and I quote, Scientists would immediately say about creatures living in outer space, well, that's impossible. There's ultraviolet radiation in space. Without having a suit or craft around you, you'll die. And then he says, well, all I can say is that these, I call them space serpents, they do exist. And he leaves it at that. Oh, well, I'm convinced. Yeah, me too. And I don't see what, what the problem with ultraviolet radiation is. I mean, yes... It causes cancer, at least some frequencies of ultraviolet radiation. And yes, Jordan, I said the word frequency, and I used it correctly. But that's not the stuff you should be worried about. I mean, yeah, if you go into space and you're exposed to that radiation, yes, that'll take years off your life. But seriously, that's not the problem. There's so much else that's stupid about this. Oh. This goes back to the thing about the Van Allen belt and radiation and how humans can't possibly go to space because of it. Now, yeah. they're, now they're saying that space serpents can live in space, but we can't wearing suits. Because apparently now the Van Allen belts are made of ultraviolet radiation. Like I say, I think my uh, sanity was going, but what did they actually say about space serpents? They just say it's a space serpent or do they actually try and flesh out what space serpents are the guy um chris everard just makes an assertion he just goes well they do this as in they they, they feed on the upper the moisture from planets yeah they feed from the moisture of planets he says the most important thing to say about the space serpents is that there are temple sites in mexico and other places on earth seven or eight of these temples that oh, are, that's right that are dedicated to flying serpents and he says that what we see in the cloud footage are these flying serpents that there's a similarity and then he says yeah I'm sorry, I can, I can sum this up for Star Trek fans out there. You know those paintings the kids made of the crystalline entity? There you go. <laughs> and also they photosynthesize apparently, which he pulled out of his ass. Yeah, and at the very end of his little monologue, he says, quote, there also seems to be an interesting relationship between the flying serpent and the small luminous spheres. And we never get to hear what the small luminous spheres are or what that is. One of the tenets here, just like with any other uh, conspiracy theory, is accept it exists and then make up theories about why it exists and what it does. The mindset really amazes me. I just, just saying this is real because I have no reason for it. I can't, I can't grasp that. Yeah, it's very common with conspiracy theorists. They do start off with, here's what happened. I think this will like, find all the anomalies that can fit it. It's like a lot of dot joining when the dots don't actually match up in the slightest. Ancient aliens. They're doing science the wrong way. They're doing anti-science because they're starting with their conclusion and they're working backwards to find reasons to back up what they already believe. And yet there was another moment that just stuck out was they showed footage of two alleged craft and he says they're flying in a cylindrical formation. How two separate craft can manage to fly in a cylinder shape? 
even when the footage is on screen and it's quite blatantly, they're not flying in that formation whatsoever, even if they, it is things flying. Well, it's not an exact cylinder, but it's some kind of cylinder. Yeah, if you broaden the definition of cylinder to things that aren't cylinders, yeah. So what is in part two, Jen? Because I think the rest of us didn't get that far. Uh, well, there's part two of this particular episode, which is more about the Illuminati conquest of space. And then there's Secret oh, yeah. Space 2. Uh, Neil Armstrong was a Freemason. Yeah, that as well, yeah. And then, and then there's uh, Secret Space 2, which is Alien Invasion. Was there an alien invasion that we don't know about that happened? Uh, maybe in the past, but that's Michael Tellinger's field. If you've ever heard of Michael Tellinger, you might understand that he believes that the... He, he, he flips between either it being aliens or being gods and them having a slave race on Earth based in Africa where they were used to mine gold out of the Earth using acoustic levitation. Because slaves and Africa... Yeah, well, obviously. Yep, slave species of the gods. That's Michael Tellinger's field. But yeah, there's, there's all sorts of interlocking shit here. So this one was made by this Chris Everard guy, wasn't it, Jen? That's right, yeah. We watched about the first half of the first episode, um, which is called The Illuminati Conquest of Space, Volume 1. So do you know anything more about this guy? Um, I know a few bits and pieces, but not a great deal. I know he doesn't really have a very good way of building his theories, um, which is completely unsurprising. And he's got a website which he charges, I think, £20 a year for, for access. Um, and he just makes various different documentaries for it. Well, I'm looking on it and there's actually surprisingly little about the man himself. He claims to speak Sumerian and Latin, and he taught himself how to speak those languages. Yeah, he also, he believes in alchemy and uh, various other interesting, kooky stuff alongside, you know, solar power, which he thinks he's an expert on, and various other bits and pieces, archaeology. The video that was linked to for all of us to watch, that's just a tiny portion of the, the actual documentary, and it's also a series of documentaries. Oh yes, there is more of this cancer. But from what I understand, if you see the first half of what we watched, then... It gets, it's basically repetition after that, isn't it, it? It is and it isn't. I mean, it goes into pretty much every conspiracy theory you've ever heard of relating to the Second World War and relating to ufology and the Illuminati and various other bits and pieces and the occult, and it throws it all together. What does it say about these people who believe and push this stuff that they can't discriminate or select the conspiracy theories they want to believe in? They feel this compelling urge to try to bring it all together into a single package. They don't want to leave anything out. They don't, they don't want to be selective about the worldview they're building up. It's this whole truth is stranger than fiction mentality that they, they have driving them. So they believe that if the reality is quite mundane, then there must be a, a more extraordinary truth behind it. And that's basically the basis for pretty much every conspiracy theory. So you're very credulous to things that sound amazing, whereas the mundane truth of things isn't really interesting enough to you to be real. Yeah, and it's not special. Exactly, yeah. You Mindset. want to know something that no one else knows, that most people don't buy into, but you do because you are so clever that you've figured it all out. Once you have that mindset of just asserting things and believing in that something can be, you know, covered up, you can believe anything. It kind of all comes together that way. Any disconfirming evidence can just be dismissed as part of the conspiracy, right? That's what they want you to think. That's always... Yeah. As the old uh, Ancient Aliens tagline goes, is it that we've been to space and we've been to the moon using readily available technology for which the patents can be looked back upon to the dawn of technological advancement? Or is it also possible that ancient aliens came down and visited planet Earth, seeded our entire human race, and they're still hiding inside of the moon and sending out alpha waves to control our minds? And the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> the main thing of this talk is what's the end goal of all these aliens and, that, and why is the government hiding it? Clearly, we're a, a um, highly advanced, highly technical uh, reality TV show. Yeah, because that's what I can't get is what is the conclusion that we're meant to be drawing? Because at least, you know, like I say, with the 9 11 truthers, it's quite clear what they, you know, what they think the conclusion is. But with this one, there's just, I didn't know what, what is he saying the conclusion is yet? I couldn't figure it out. It's the Truman yeah, Show. Is it? All right. The, there really didn't seem to be a point. 
Yeah, so the people who watch this and believe this stuff, what are they supposed to think they're to do? So let's say, let's say somebody watches it and believes it. Do they ask themselves, now what? What do I do about this? Or do they just say, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the point. Now they, they know the truth. And that makes them feel really special. And they need I, to tell all the sheeple to wake up. Yeah. I wonder if they think about it deeply enough to consider what you guys were asking, where what is the point? What are the aliens doing? Why is this being hidden? I, I have to wonder if they if they think about it deeply enough to consider those kind of things. They do, actually. I, I mean, so. no, they, they, they do deep think about it that deeply because they think it's all an experiment. They think it's a controlled experiment. They think there's some sort of nefarious, depending on which conspiracy theorist you, th you speak to, some think that there's a, an underlying nefarious purpose that they have. Yeah, I haven't quite grasped yet and that we are a, a slave race and that we have an ultimate purpose to develop something for these aliens and others just see us as an experiment sort of ants you know uh, bugs in a petri dish or ants in an ant farm that kind of thing and once you go down that kind of route you can go pretty much anywhere yeah Carl, i think you mentioned it earlier on didn't you the, the film um battlefield earth which is actually one of the genuine theories about you know humanity being a slave race yeah, uh, I'm actually struggling to think whether the plot of Battlefield Earth is more credible in this film. Uh, Marty, what do you think? <laughs> I'm trying not to. Yeah, because Battlefield Earth has cavemen learning to fly Harrier jump jets in like three days yeah. or something, and then taking out a supposedly advanced alien race, but the advanced alien race is populated by idiots and John Travolta evilly cackling all the time. Oh, the wonderful world of L. Ron Hubbard. Oh, that's yeah. enough. I think that's going to be an episode on its own. <laughs> that's a good idea for an episode, that. Yeah, definitely. Well, there was a lot of uh, parallels with Scientology here. Real power being one of them, because, of course, real power, the occult and all that kind of stuff is um, is based on a science fiction writer's work. And once again, L. Ron, L. Ron Hubbard comes along, science fiction writer, once again, he starts his own cult. So it's two different kinds of cult followings. See the maker of this film, Jen. Is he well known on the conspiracy theory circuit? He's fairly well known, yeah. I mean, he's, he's got a few followers. Conspiracy theorists will know him. I know he's well known on sort of David Icke forums and that kind of stuff, which I think I'm still banned from. Yeah, he's pretty well known. So, like, is he well known, like, within Alec Jones circles and all that? He's obviously not the level Alec Jones is, obviously. I don't know. Right. I don't know about Alec Jones um, circles. I haven't looked at that in years. I'm curious about how uh, those morons are going to react now when uh, one of them is president. Yeah, it's, I mean, just this probably is going off top because they were so behind Trump, the conspiracy theorist movement, and now it's yeah. going to be really weird to see them defending the US government for the next four years. Yeah, and it's also going to be fun to see when he doesn't declassify all the information that proves we didn't go to the moon and all that shit. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting four years over here, because uh, on one hand, they're on a back foot now. They're at a disadvantage with one of their favorite rhetorical lines of argument about the government censoring them and the government suppressing the truth. And now they yeah. have a president that they backed that uh, won't do the thing that they expect their idealistic president image to do. And now they, they can't use that line anymore about suppression and censorship. Oh, they'll find a way. Uh, they'll find a way, Nathan. I mean, what they'll do, all they'll do basically is they'll say that he's been turned or he's been controlled or he's been replaced by a robot or a lizard or something like that. Well, that would be an improvement. Yeah, because I think that's a big thing of the conspiracy theorist mindset is that they are the underdog. And I think if they get that taken away, then I, I've got to say that kind of takes away the impetus to be in, a, in that movement, I would yeah. think anyway. I mean, it's almost like a, a general know the name Charlie Brooker. He's a well-known... Uh, British commentator here, he pointed out that the second Obama was elected, Fox News, you could even just see, oh, thank goodness, now we can kind of claim, you know, we're the underdog here and we're being suppressed. Charlie Brooke is amazing. He's the guy who did, um, is it Black Mirror? Yeah, and Dead Set. Yeah, fantastic guy. But there is one that he does do, there's a clip he did about American News and he just said, like, now that Obama's in charge, they're relishing this. It's kind of the same with the conspiracy theories. When Obama was in charge, it just kind of, that. oh, yeah, we are. Look at this. And he's a tyrant and all this. But like I say, I just cannot see where they're going to go now with Donald Trump. They will probably turn against him eventually. 
Well, Dave, I, David Icke will say that uh, he's been replaced, like Jen suggested, by a reptilian or a robot or something. I wouldn't put that past David Icke, and that seems like the easiest way out for them, I think. Well, I think Mike Adams is already claiming that they're going to throw Donald Trump out of office because he's going to get too close to revealing the truth. Yeah, we're all in trouble if the truth of the universe is held in the hands of Donald Trump. They'll just drop it, won't it? He'll drop it and it'll break, and that'll be the end of the truth. Yeah, he has small hands. <laughs> exactly. Boom. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I think once Donald Trump goes out of office, however that happens, it's they're just going to say, oh, well, he had to. He had to go along with them. They were just too powerful, and they suppressed him as well. Or so I think that's how they'll play it. Or if he does get assassinated like Kennedy did, um, which is a distinct possibility considering some of the crazies out there, they'll just use that like they did with Kennedy as an F uh, evidence of some sort of a cover-up. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Alex Jones, I think it was Coughlin that said that no matter how Alex Jones dies, that's going to be part of the conspiracy for them. They're going to be yeah. convinced he was killed for what he said. And it'd be the same if that happens to Donald Trump. It doesn't matter how blatant and clear cuts it would be. They would just be convinced, yeah, he was taken out for this. Well, that just goes without saying that any president who dies by assassination is always a part of not just a small local conspiracy, which it usually is, but a massive global conspiracy. I yeah. don't know. Mike Pence is pretty good assassination insurance. Yeah. I think we can uh, get our final thoughts if we have the capacity for that anymore on this film. Yeah, I think we can start to wrap up now. Uh, go to you, Marty, your final thoughts on this. It was stupid. Okay, Jen. I have to admit to being Illuminati. And a um, Jewish Nazi. Uh, Kitch. I hear that the epic space Jews versus the space Nazis is going to be the plot of Rogue One. <laughs> Uh, Julia, what, is, what were your final thoughts on this? I was disappointed, honestly. I, I think I dosed off a couple of times. I, I watched it twice, and I still missed things. And I'm pretty sure it was about 50% soundtrack and scary music and sound effects. Yeah, that's really all it was. Yeah, I think that's it. And uh, just as I note to the audience, take a vote on who on the panel you think is either a Jew or a Nazi. I think to all the people listening. And... Back to you, Nathan. I think we'll let you close it off there. My final thoughts on this are that it was a mess, and I watch a lot of junk science and pseudoscience stuff. Kind of like Jen, I kind of eat this stuff up and enjoy it masochistically, but even for me, this was painful to watch and sit through. The craziness aspect of it almost wasn't enough to justify the awfulness of the production value. This is also my answer to one question I got on my Facebook feed. Somebody asks, can you recommend it or is it a waste of time? I would say it's a waste of time unless you want to invest research and understanding into the conspiracy theory mindset. But even then, this isn't a good primer for that. Just watch yeah. Iron Sky instead. Yeah, watch Iron Sky. Or Bloodstorm, also called Nazis at the Center of the Earth with uh, Jake Busey in it. Fantastic. It's got a robot Hitler. Highly recommend. Awesome. Just as a, a final thing, the reason we did review this film was because we each nominated a film and we put it to a public vote. And I think we're just going to go to the film that was second in that vote, which is Vax. That will be done in a few weeks. So I don't know if we can say we're looking forward to that or not. So we're going to watch it anyway. I, oh god yeah i've got a copy of that so that will be uh not just painful but infuriating i'm sure because faxed is one of those films that actually has the potential to do really great harm on the next show which will come out in two weeks i believe we're going to be joined by natalie newell she is uh, one of the hosts of the Science Enthusiast podcast, and she runs the Skeptical Parenting Facebook page, and she's also the producer and director of a documentary that's coming out this next year called Science Moms, where she's addressing the whole mommy blogger movement and the way pseudoscientists such as anti-vaxxers and anti-GMO people are targeting young parents and young mothers specifically, and We'll be talking about what she and some of her colleagues are doing to battle that whole movement. 
yeah, I'm looking forward to that because I've seen the mommy yeah. blogger movement in, in action and they're quite an insidious bunch, I have to say. Well, everybody, have a good rest of your weekend, whatever's left of it, wherever you are, and I'll see you when I see you next. Bye. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.